Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Numbers. The Old Testament book of Numbers in Numbers chapter number 35. Numbers in chapter number 35. We're in our last few messages. In fact, if I remember right, including this message, we have six more left in this series. Of course, we could go in a lot more detail with the life and ministry of Moses, but we're just trying to hit some of the highlights and some of the important parts of the narrative account of the life and ministry of Moses. And we find our way to the book of Numbers, chapter number 35. The book of Numbers in chapter number 35. Now, remember that whenever God repeats or says something, we know it's important. If God repeats it, then it's something we need to pay attention to. And if it's something mentioned several times, it's something that God is placing the emphasis on. And that we must always place the emphasis where God places the emphasis. And the passage tonight is something that's repeated several different times in the Old Testament, dealing with the idea of Moses, and then again in the book of Joshua. Something that was vital in God's idea of setting up this brand new nation to make sure that they had this protection and if you this way of escape and so notice with me in the book of numbers chapter 35 numbers chapter 35 and let's pick it up in verse number 10 numbers 35 and verse number 10 the word of God says this Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye come over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither, which killeth any person at unawares. And they shall be unto you cities of refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. And of these cities which ye shall give, six cities shall ye have for refuge. And ye shall give three cities on this side of Jordan, and three cities shall ye give in the land of Canaan, which shall be cities of refuge. And these six cities shall be a city shall be a refuge both to the children of Israel and for the stranger. And for the sojourner among them, that every one that killeth any person unawares may flee thither. And if he smite him with an instrument of iron, <coughs> so that he die, he is a murderer, and the murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he smite him with a throwing stone, wherewith he may die, and he die, He is a murderer, and the murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he shall smite him with a hand weapon of wood, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer, and the murderer shall surely be put to death. The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him, and he shall slay him. But if he thrusteth him of hatred, or hurl at him by lying of weight, or or he die, or an enmity smite him with his hand that he die, he smote him, shall surely be put to death, for he's a murderer. The revenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. But if he thrusteth him suddenly without enmity, or cast upon him without anything laying of weight, or if any stone wherewith any man may die, seeing him not, and was cast upon him that he die, and was not his enemy, neither sought his harm, then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments. And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, whether he fled, and he shall abide in it until the death of the high priest, which was anointed with the holy oil. But if the slayer shall come at any time without the border of the city of his refuge, whether he fled, the revenger of blood find him without the borders, the city of his refuge, the, and the revenger of blood shall kill the slayer. He shall not be guilty of blood. Because 
he should have remained in the city of his refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer shall return unto the land of his possession. So these things shall be for a statute of judgment unto you throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. But one witness shall not testify against a person to cause him to die. Moreover, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall surely put to death. And ye shall take no satisfaction for him that is fled to the city of his refuge, that he should come again to dwell in the land until the death of the priest. So ye are not to pollute the land wherein ye are, for blood it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood that sheddeth it. Defile not therefore the land which ye shall inhabit, Wherein I dwell, for I the Lord dwell among the children of Israel. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that is repeated several times in this passage and several others? Notice again the first mention of it in verse number 11. The cities of refuge. The cities of of refuge. And with the Lord's help, we want to hit this, this ordinance, this order that God had placed, and it is carried out and mentioned several times throughout Scripture, this principle here of the cities of refuge. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to this passage here and dive in and understand here. We understand that for the practical reason that you were wise in setting this up. But Lord, it was also a foreshadow of what you would do for us. I'm asking that we would have spiritual eyes and be able to understand your scripture, to be able to see what you are getting across and the principles that you give us through your precious scripture. Lord, I'm very conscious of my need of you tonight. Lord, help me to trust and depend upon you That these good folks, they don't need to hear from me. They need to hear from your word. They need to hear from you. And I'm asking that I would be out of the way. And that you would fill me with your spirit. and Just use me as a vessel. But they would hear from you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we have the book of Numbers here, this is an important principle. Once again, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 19, this principle is given again. And then it is finally carried out in the book of Joshua chapter 20. And if you wouldn't mind to go with me to the book of Joshua chapter 20, we want to see as this uh, cities of refuge are actually carried out. Now, what has happened between where we were at in the book of Numbers, chapter number 35, and where we're at here in Joshua chapter 20, is that we know that Moses had led the people to the edge of the promised land, that he preached the book of Deuteronomy in a space of a month uh, to the people to try to prepare them to give the second telling of the law to remind them the things that God had set for them. And then Moses died. Joshua carried the people over the Jordan River. And they began to have their military campaigns. They started with the central campaign. Then they went to the southern campaign. And then the northern campaign. And they occupied the land. And now as they come to uh, this part of the book of Joshua. They begin to divide out the land between the tribes. Now remember we already had two and a half tribes. That are on the other side of Jordan. To the east side of the Jordan. By God's permission. We had Reuben. We had Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh. The other tribes here. Are now having the land divided out to them. And by God's order, God had demanded and asked that there would be six cities of refuge that would be established for the people of Israel. And three would be on the west side of the Jordan. Three would be on the east side of the Jordan. And there was a strategic idea that was placed in here for the cities of refuge. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to take this time to explore with you. We're going to stay in the book of Joshua for the most part here. But we want to understand these idea of the city of refuge. The first thing is the purpose Of the city of refuge. The purpose of the cities of refuge. Notice with me in Joshua chapter 20. Joshua chapter 20. And notice with me in verse 1. 
And the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge, whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer that killeth any person unawares and unwittingly may flee thither, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. And when he that doth flee into one of these cities shall stand at the entering of the gate of the city and shall declare his cause in the ears of the elders of the city, and they shall take him into the city unto them and give him a place that he may dwell among them. And if the avenger of blood pursue after him, then they shall not deliver the slayer up into his hand because he smote his neighbor unwittingly and hated him not before time, and he shall dwell in that city until he stand before the congregation of judgment, and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days, then shall the slayer return and come to his own city, and unto his own house, and unto the city from whence he fled. Here we could see the summary of the purpose of the city of refuge. And what this was, was to set up a safety zone, so that way it wasn't like the old west of America where everyone was taking justice in their own hands. Now, to back up things just a little bit more, we know that <laughs> that the first murderer in the Bible was Cain slaying his brother Abel. And Cain, after he had slayed his brother Abel, had begged God not to allow his life to uh to be taken. And so God placed a mark upon Cain so that way he could not be touched, that no one would touch him and uh, kill him for the crime that he had done. Well, this had set precedent. And so during the time of from Adam and Eve to Seth to Cain, all of that generation, all the way up to Noah's Ark, there was no rules. <laughs> it was it was the Wild West. That if someone killed someone, it was okay. No one was going to do anything about it. There was no consequences. In fact, Cain had a descendant who said, Guess what? I've killed more people than Cain. And if Cain deserved death, I deserve even more. No one's going to do anything about it. And so it was just an awful, awful time. And because there was no consequences for sin, everyone was just supposed to do what was right based off of conscience, not because of law, we found that man couldn't handle that. With no rules, man becomes corrupt until it finally comes to the place that man was wicked and did everything that his imagination told him to. His thoughts were evil continually. And so when God brought the flood to destroy the world and save Noah and his family alive, as soon as they got off the ark, as soon as they were walking into the land that God had prepared for them, the very first rule that God set up was capital punishment. That if someone killed another person by murder, if someone murdered someone, so motive was there, they did it on purpose, that that person was supposed to be executed. Capital punishment. It was supposed to be following through. We understand that in our world today, that is not something that is looked favorably upon, but God understood the nature of man. We've already witnessed what had happened when there was no rules and you could do whatever you want. If you're not afraid of the consequences, then it's going to be chaos. And so God's the one who instituted the idea of capital punishment. Now, by the time it came here, this idea that God had said that if someone murdered, that their life was to be taken, had been set. Now God is setting up a place to protect those that were not guilty of murder. Now, we had saw before in the book of Deuteronomy where we read to that God took time to explain the difference between murder and an accident. And so if someone had a hand weapon and they premeditatedly made a weapon and they saw their enemy and they killed him, that's murder. All right? If, if you did it on purpose, you thought it would be fun, that's murder. And by the way, the cities of refuge are not for you. You are deserving of death. But we understand that because of life, accidents happen. And so it goes through in the book of Deuteronomy 
or the book of Numbers to give some illustrations. So let's say that I'm working on something and uh, a stick breaks or something and jabs someone accidentally. It wasn't on purpose. It was just an accident. Well, I'm not guilty of murder. However, there's always the revenge principle that if I killed a family member, then the rest of the family members want to come after me. Well, God says, I want to set up a protection so that way their life isn't taken. Because murder would occur if someone had accidentally killed someone. It was an accident. There was an accident that occurred. The slayers that would take revenge, they would be committing murder. So God had tried to set it up so there would be protection. Now, of course, the people who are wanting revenge, they're not going to be thinking clearly. So you have to bring it to a court, to bring it to a magistrate, to bring it to the elders of a city so they could judge it and make sure that things were done properly. It gives an illustration. Let's say that I'm clearing out some rocks and I'm not paying attention and I toss a rock behind me and it bonks someone in the head, hits them just right and it cracks their skull and they die. I'm not guilty of murder, but I understand his family is not going to be happy with me. And so I could flee to a city of refuge, plead my case, and I can stay there. And then it set up the principle that as long as I stayed within that city, that revenger could not touch me. Meaning, I was not guilty of murder. I was, I, it was an accident. Something happened. As long as I stayed within the protection of that city... I could not be touched. And so it set this up, these six cities of refuge, so that way each person could run there and be protected. And as long as they stayed there, they would be protected. And then it gave the principle how long he could stay there. Well, I could stay there safely until the high priest of of Israel died. And then everything was reset. I can go home. And so... (laughs) You'd kind of hope that the, uh, the high priest was an uh, older gentleman. Not, so I didn't have to stay there and be reset. If it was a young guy who's pretty healthy, I might be in that city for a long time. That's a different thing altogether. But I'm saying that you stayed there and you were protected until uh, the high priest died. And then the clean slate, I could go back home and technically no one was supposed to come after me. And so this is the principle of the city of refuge. We'll go over some more details in a second. But as we come to Joshua, as they're dividing out the land, God spoke to Joshua and said, I want you to divide out six cities of refuge, six places where people can flee that even though they may be worthy of death in someone's eyes, they can run to and be protected from the death that they deserve to have. Now we come to something interesting, maybe interesting to some people, may not to others, the names of the cities of refuge. As we're in the book of Joshua, chapter number 20, the first several verses deal with the setting up of the city of refuge. Of course, we had saw more detail in the book of Numbers, chapter number uh, 35, and then once again, it's repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 19. But as we're here in the book of Joshua, They have these cities that are appointed out. Notice with me in verse number 7. And they appointed Kadesh in Galilee, in Mount Nephtali, and Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and Kertha um, Kerem, which is in Hebron, in the mountain of Judah. And on the other side of Jordan, by Jericho, eastward, they... uh, they assigned Bezer in the wilderness upon the plain out of the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead out of the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan out of the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel, for the stranger that sojourneth among them, that whosoever killeth any person at unawares might flee thither and may not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. Now, (laughs) with this, we could see these cities set aside and there's something about names, especially Bible names. Names were important. So just listen to the names of these places. First of all, you had Kadesh, which meant holy place. It was a place where people can go. It was called, the city itself was Kadesh, which meant holy place. Then you had Shechem, which meant 
strong shoulder. You had Hebron, which meant fellowship. You had Bezer, which was a strong hiding place. You had Ramoth, which was a high place. Then you had Glowen, which meant the enclosure for captives. And so these were cities, and their names were significant because they're going to point to someone. Now, with these cities, all of these cities were located on hills. That way, no matter where you're at, you could see where the city was at, and you could run to that city. It was made on a high place where everyone can see it. They were on a plain marked road. So they weren't in a little desolate place, you know. In the south, we'd often get directions like this. All right, you turn left over here, you get past the main path, and you go down the dirt road for a while. And it, The cities of refuge were on a plain path. They were easily found. In addition, it was Jewish law that once a year the roads were repaired and clear signage was posted so all could find it. And so these cities of refuge were supposed to be places people could easily find. The roads were made so that way you could travel there with no problems. The signage was clear so you understood exactly where you're going and how to get there. You could not get lost in order to find it. They also had designed the cities of refuge. So no matter where you were in the nation of Israel. There was not a city of refuge that was not more than one day away. So they made it so no matter where you were at. You could make it to a city of refuge in a day. So they made it so it was easy to find. It was marked well so you could locate it. You couldn't get lost. It was made on hills so you could see where it is. It was designed so you could get there without a lot of time. You could get there quickly and didn't have to do a lot of things to get there. Oh, one of the wonderful things too, according to Joshua chapter 20 and verse 9, as well as Numbers 35 verse 15. It was available for Gentiles. It was available for anyone. You didn't have to be a specific type of person. Anyone could go to the city of refuge and get the release, get the help that you needed. What a wonderful God that designed it so whosoever would could come. Now with this, some of you are already starting to see the hints to it. Let's see how Christ is pictured In the cities of refuge. Let's do the comparison of these. With this turn with me if you don't mind. And let's look at what the Bible has to say. Concerning this. Just to show that this isn't pastor's idea. That I was reading the cities of refuge. And say you know what. This might look to Christ. Let me show you that the Bible says. These cities of refuge were a point to Christ. Notice with me in Psalm 46. Psalm 46. We'll start with an Old Testament passage. But Psalm 46, and notice this verse. Psalm 46 and verse number 1. God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble. You know who God is? God is the one that you could run to when you need help. That when you find yourself in trouble, you just take the marked path and you run to God and He is available. He is our refuge. He's the one we could run to when we are in trouble. Let's look at the New Testament. Let's look at the book of Hebrews. And remember, as we've been promoting lately, the book of Hebrews is the New Testament um, commentary on the Old Testament law. And it is filtered through the light of Jesus Christ. So looking at the law, looking at the law of Moses, looking at the Old Testament pictures, and looking at them through Jesus Christ, we could see even more. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in um, the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18. Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse number 18. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, 
we might have a strong consolation. Who hath fled for refuge to lay upon the hope set before us? Here it is taking, remember the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrew people. And the Hebrew people would understand the cultural reference that is being made here. Here it's saying, guess what? There are two things, two immutable. That word immutable means unchangeable. There are two things that will never, ever change. You want to know what they are? It is impossible for God to lie. Aren't you glad that God will always keep his word? It doesn't matter what it is. God can not lie. And because God cannot lie, notice this thing here. We might have a strong consolation who hath fled for refuge. This is talking as an, an a culture idea of the city of refuge to lay a hold upon the hope that is set before us. So here it builds on this. First of all, God can't lie. And because he can't lie, the uh, other unchangeable truth is that we could trust him. God can't lie. Because he can't lie, we can trust him. Now, think about what we're trusting God for. We are trusting God for forgiveness of our sins. The Bible is clear. It says, for the wages of sin is death. We know without a doubt, we deserve to die. And the only reason, the only reason why I believe that I can have forgiveness of sins is because God told me so. Think about that. That's the only way I know that my sins are forgiven. But if I believe that God could lie, then my hope is shaky as well. But if I can trust his word that he cannot lie, my hope is true. That God is going to keep his word. I have run to God for refuge. I am not trusting in my works. I am not trusting in my ability to make things right. I am not trusting in, in some way of repaying the debt. My trust and hope is in Christ and Christ alone. That is who I ran to for refuge. I came to Christ saying, I deserve to die. Help me, Jesus. Help me. And God keeps his word. And because he keeps his word, I can put my hope, my trust, my faith, my belief in him. So we understand that the Bible gives a refer uh, reference of this, that Jesus this is a picture. The cities of refuge are a picture of Jesus Christ. So let's compare the two of how Jesus and the city of refuge are in more detail. First of all, both Jesus and the city of refuge are within easy reach of the needy person. Remember, the city of refuge was designed so no a city of refuge was always within a day's travel. You could easily make it to the city of refuge. And by the way, Jesus has made himself so accessible that all you have to do for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He made it so you don't have to go through hula hoops. You don't have to do any tricks. You don't have to do any hurdles. All you have to do is come to him. That Jesus is within easy reach of whosoever needeth him. Call upon me. That's all that's required is to call upon him. That they're both of, of easy reach. Think about that. <laughs> they were no use to anyone if they couldn't get there. Could you imagine having a city of refuge? Yes, if you could just make it to the city, you'll be safe. But the city is so far away and you have to travel through mountains and you have to take passage. You have to get a ship to go over there and you have to do this. What good is a city of refuge if you can't get there? What's the use of Jesus Christ if you can't get to him? Jesus can save you, but in order to get to him, you have to go crawl on your knees up these steps. And you have to pay a million dollars. And you have to do all of this fancy words. And do this, this reconciliation. And get this right and fix this. 
Well, then you couldn't make it. In order for the city of refuge to be a practical help, you had to be able to get to it easily and quickly. What's the second thing and we compare them? Both the Jesus and the city of refuge were open to all. Both Jesus and the city of refuge were open to all. It wasn't just the Israelite. No one needed to fear that they would be turned away. Jesus would be glad to take them in their time of need. Jesus will not turn anyone away. He's not going to say the color of your skin is not right. The place of your birth is not right. Your parentage, your ancestral lineage is not right. He says, come unto me. Come unto me. I'll take anybody if they're willing to come. God had designed the cities of refuge so even a Gentile heathen could go to the city of refuge and get that protection when he needed it. God had designed it so it was open for all. What was something else here? Both Jesus and the city of refuge became a place where one in need could live. You didn't come to a city of refuge in time of need just to look around. You would come to the city of refuge and you would live there until the high priest died. Well, guess what? When you come to Jesus as the city of refuge, you can live there until the high priest dies. And by the way, our high priest will never die. You go there to stay. You go there to live. You make a living. You, you have a life there. And by the way, when you come to Jesus Christ, it's not a thing that, oh, how horrible. I have to give up everything I enjoy and I just have to be here in Jesus and just stare at the walls. That's not the life that God intended you to have. He wanted to give you life, but not just life, life more abundantly. He wanted to be a place where you can live. And the cities of refuge was designed to be a place where you could live. What's something else that you could find. About Jesus and the city of refuge. Both Jesus and the cities of refuge. Were the only alternative. For the one in need. Without the specific protection. They would be destroyed. There was no other option. It was the only place you can go. If you thought that you were worthy of death. You could run to the city of refuge. There was no other option. And by the way. There is no other way to get into heaven. But by Jesus Christ. There's no other way to be forgiven of your sins. Which the wages of sin is death. There's no other way to escape that penalty. But by Jesus Christ. Amen. There is no other way. There are no other alternatives. What else do we understand about Jesus and the city of refuge? That Jesus and the cities of refuge provided protection only within their boundaries. To go outside meant death. Remember the law was set up. So if somebody went to the city of refuge. And they lived there they were safe. But the law also made a provision that if they stepped outside of the city. While the high priest was still alive. They would be. <laughs> uh, they could be killed. Their only protection was within that city of refuge. Well, let me tell you that Jesus is our refuge. And as long as we stay with him, by the way, Jesus told us that everyone that was given to him, no man can pluck them out. And by the way, you're placed in God's hand and no man can pluck you out either. You're safe within Jesus. Jesus has you there and you are safe. And within the boundary of Jesus Christ, there's all protection that you have. Something else that we understand about the cities of refuge, both Jesus and the cities of refuge, full freedom comes with the death of the high priest. Now, we understand when Jesus died, the penalty that we owed, him, owed God was done. We'll never owe him the penalty of death ever again. That when the high priest died, the people in the city of refuge can go back to their lives 
and no longer fear death. Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. And when he died, it released us. And we no longer owe that debt again. That debt is paid. We could go back and live the lives. What a wonderful thing that God set up. That God set up these cities of refuge, first of all, for the idea of a practical nature. To be able to protect those who were physically in danger. But he also did as a foreshadow of things to come. A picture that everyone in Israel would understand there's a city of refuge. They would understand what it was for. And of course through the light of the book of Hebrews and the light of Jesus Christ. That the people could go and say look I can see the comparison. Wow, you could take the city of refuge and be able to teach to a Hebrew person who was familiar with the Old Testament and point them to Jesus and say, that's our city of refuge. That's who I'm trusting to. That's who I'm depending upon. It was a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. Now, what a wonderful thing it is. Now, we understand that the people in this room, for I understand you've accepted Jesus, your Savior. There was a time where you ran to the city of refuge and you called upon him and he accepted you. He forgave you. He took care of your penalty. He's giving you a place to live. But sometimes it's good to be reminded of the details of all that we have in Jesus Christ. That he is our refuge and a strong tower. He's the one, the God we could run to in times of trouble. That in the book of Hebrews, we're reminded that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation who hath fled for refuge to lay upon the hope set before us. The teaching of the city of refuge is just a reminder of, Of our hope in Jesus Christ. You know from time to time. People may doubt their salvation. Not saying that you're not saved. People said I got saved. But Satan likes to tell tricks. He likes to tell you lies. He likes to fool you. Sometimes he'll even send a messenger. To try to tell you listen here. You could lose that salvation. Jesus wasn't honest. You know what? Did you say that magic word? Did you stand upon your head, a leg and put your hand in the air? Did you hold the Bible a certain way? They want to try to fool you. Let me tell you, Jesus is the answer. And Jesus can't lie. And he made it so simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life just as a reminder someone will say how can you know that you're going to heaven because Jesus told me so and God can't lie you know we as Christians or we as people we like to make things so complicated and sometimes we can make things so complicated that it confuses everyone let's make it simple God can't lie He made me a promise. I accepted that promise. And God will keep his word. Just as easy as that. Now I don't know what you're going through. It could be that you've been going through a hard time lately. Let me tell you. Jesus is our refuge. He is the help in time of need. Run to Jesus. It may be that you've been through a thing. Where you've been doubting your salvation. Satan's been after you and you've been looking back and say, is it true? Am I truly saved? Well, if you accept it, Christ is your savior, you are accepting his promises. It's not based off of what we do. It's based off of what he did. Can you trust him? Can you trust him? Now, again, why is this such a big deal? Let me tell you, you cannot effectively serve the Lord as long as you doubt your salvation. You say, why not? Because what ends up happening is you try to serve God in order to make sure that you're saved rather than serving God because you are saved. Your motives become wrong. Your motives become, I've got to do something. I've got to make God happy with me. I've got to make him pleased. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. Are you happy with me yet? And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. God, are you happy yet? That's not a way to live. 
That's not what God wants you to live. What God wants you to be is to the place, God, you've done so much for me. Can I do this for you? God, you've done so much for me. I'd be glad to do this for you. God, can I take care of this? And we do it because we want to. Not because we feel like we have to in order to stay within the city. We don't need to be at the place where we feel like God can kick us out at any time. You're done. You're out of the house. I'm saved not because of anything that I've done. And I stay saved not because of anything that I've done. It's because Jesus Christ has done it all. I can trust him. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.